everyone, welcome back to Who's There. I'm your host, Allison. If you're new here, thank you for joining us. This is a podcast where I talk to a new horror fan every week because I hope to destigmatize what it means to be a horror movie fan because most of us are just regular people who like the adrenaline rush of being scared for some reason, and we delve into those reasons here. First off, I'm recording this the day after the election was called for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, and may I just say, thank fucking goodness that's over. The energy was electric here in New York City yesterday, and in fact, I was alerted to the fact that the election had been called for Biden in the first place because I heard cheers and screaming out my window, and then that alerted me to turn on CNN. There were celebrations all over the city with face masks and all over the country yesterday. I know this isn't a political podcast, but I know that some of you listening are also just as relieved. Moving on, I'm super excited because this week we have the author of Eight Days in the Woods, The Making of the Blair Witch Project, Matt Blasey. We got to chatting about the first first time he saw the Blair Witch Project and how his love for the movie grew from there, how he came up with the idea for the Blair Witch experience down in Maryland, and what it was like to write a book that told the entire untold story of the making of the Blair Witch Project. I hadn't had a chance to order the book before we recorded, but I clicked order right after we finished and it's next on my to be read list. Matt's also a huge George Romero fan and he works with the George A. Romero Foundation now as their network host, and he's even appeared in two of Romero's later film, Land of the Dead and Survival of the Dead. He also hosts WGON Network, a podcast that's dedicated to celebrating all the films of Romero's. There's a lot more, but for now, I think that's good because this episode is long, so let's get into it. Hey, Matt, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for being here. Uh, Tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where you're from, why you're here, etc. Uh, my name is Matt Blasey. I am the author of Eight Days in the Woods, The Making of the Blair Witch Project, and the host of The Blair Witch Experience, an annual uh, tour of all the filming locations that was used in The Blair Witch Project. Uh, I live here in central Pennsylvania, and we're here to talk some Blair Witch, I think. Yeah, definitely. So my first question to everyone is always, what's your favorite scary movie? But can I assume it's The Blair Witch Project? Actually, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so tell us what it is. My favorite movie uh, is all, is of all time is Dawn of the Dead, the original George Romero classic. Oh, okay. That's yeah, solid. Blair, yeah, Blair Witch is like a 1A. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have more than one favorite horror movie and you rank them? Is that what you're saying? Uh, it, it's hard for me to rank my favorites. You know, everyone's like, what are your top five favorite movies? And I'm like, well, I could probably pick five. But I, the first movie I remember seeing as a kid was Dawn of the Dead. And it was always my favorite growing up. I watched it all the time. Uh, and then Blair Witch came out and it was, it just hit me at the right time. I was just like, wow. And it just, it just stuck with me. If it's, if I'm not talking Dawn of the Dead, I'm talking Blair Witch online with people most days. So that's just how it goes. Very cool. Uh, so Dawn of the Dead is how you first fell in love with the genre. Were you hooked right after that? Yeah, I I grew up, it's it's weird because I just had this conversation with someone yesterday was someone said, wow, your parents must have been really cool. And I said, yeah, my parents were pretty cool, but my dad taped all these movies off TV and I have no idea why because my dad's not a movie person. So I grew up watching some of the Friday the 13th, the stuff I probably shouldn't have been watching. So for some reason he taped Dawn of the Dead and that just that just instantly resonated with me. And I mean, I grew up with Terminator, a huge Arnold Schwarzenegger fan. But yeah, I, I grew up with this collection of videotapes that my dad had taped off the movie channels. And I couldn't I couldn't tell you why, because my dad doesn't go to the movies. He doesn't buy movies. We don't talk movies. But for some reason, there was a point in his life where he just decided to start taping stuff he thought looked good. And I inherited them. And that's kind of how I got into horror. And it was it probably from the age of three or four was probably when I got hooked. Oh, wow. That's really young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when yeah. most people come on here and say, I probably watched so-and-so movie way too young, they mean like nine or 10, but three or four is very young. Yeah. I remember going to see uh, Pumpkinhead in the theater with my grandmother. I think I was seven <laughs> and I got really, really disappointed that the monster did not have a pumpkin for a head. Cause I, I just, it, it didn't make sense to me at the age of seven. You know, so you go see a movie named Pumpkinhead, and there's a big pumpkin on a monster. And no, so stuff like that. My grandmother took me to see all the movies. She showed me all the movies on, on her tape with my uncle. So just wow. as long as I can remember, I've been into movies and, and especially horror. Wow. Sounds like you had a cool grandmother, too. 
Yeah, she was she was pretty cool. She let me watch all the Arnold movies in her living room and stuff like The Warriors. I mean, there wasn't there wasn't much I wasn't allowed to watch. Um, I would be interested uh, as to what your dad would say if you asked him, Dad, why did you tape all these movies when I was a kid? I don't even think he can remember. I think it must have been because it was the early 80s and VCRs were new and he would just find a movie and be like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll tape it and watch it later. I couldn't tell you if my dad ever watched anything he ever taped. Okay, so why do you think that people who seem perfectly sane love the horror genre? Oh, why do perfectly sane people love the horror genre? I think it's it's a really simple escape. Everyone talks about, oh, they hate being scared, but they love being scared. They love that that unknown. There's there's just something about what's around the corner or what's in that creepy house or or old factory or a monster chasing you. It's 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 overcoming adversity. It's like, well, what would I do in that situation? So I think a lot of people watch horror movies and really try to envision themselves, like how would they kill the monster or what would they do or how would they avoid being in that situation? Because, you know, horror movies are, are social commentaries, but they're good for watching in a group and they're a movie you can sit and talk about during the movie. And I, I just think we project a lot of our own ideas and and beliefs and and feelings onto the characters on screen. Oh, that makes sense. So at the beginning of COVID, did you watch a lot of pandemic movies to figure out what you would do? Uh, I had been pretty familiar with, you know, Outbreak. It was always a, a good one for me. I had actually, it was funny because Contagion was on HBO and I said, oh, this is kind of appropriate. And I ended up having to watch it like twice because I missed a little bit in the beginning and a little bit in the middle. So I went back and watched it. I said, oh, this will be interesting if this is how this this gets to. But it's just, it's so weird how a lot of horror movies are are relevant during this this COVID pandemic because we watch stuff like The Thing and, and Contagion and Outbreak and, and, and these movies like this. And it's like, oh man, these were ahead of their time because these it's happening now. Yeah, I've read some interviews with the, um, the scientists that worked on Contagion because they wanted it to be really um, authentic. And he was talking about how like, yeah, yeah, this is what it's like. And uh, when they said the words social distancing and contagion, when I rewatched it in April, I was like, I get it. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We weren't, we weren't saying it every time we went somewhere or posted something online, but I remember hearing social distancing and I was like, I think I've heard that on the news once or twice lately. And, and now it's, it's just something it's, we say it every day, every time we go somewhere. What has it been like with COVID in Pennsylvania? It's, it's been interesting there's there's some areas that really take it seriously and then there's places where it's there there's resistance uh to put it nicely um i work in the financial industry so i i'm around people the public all the all the time and and i talk to other business owners and places that i that i frequent and i say how's it going and they go it's not too bad but you know there's always that one or two cases a week where someone just has to put up a fight or they they want to make it harder for everybody. So it's it it's been pretty consistent like that since day one. I mean, we're a big state, but yeah, I mean, it could be better. I, I have friends that have come here from out of state, and they see a stark contrast from New Jersey, Maryland, uh, and New York that it, we're not doing as much as we probably should. Well, hopefully, hopefully it gets better. Yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> Can I ask why Dawn of the Dead resonated with you when you were three or four and you watched it? Zombies? I, I don't know. There was there was something about the zombies and being in a shopping mall because I you used to go with your mom or dad to the shopping mall on a Saturday and, and walk around and, you know, obviously the gore. There was just some awesome scenes of gore that just, I was like, oh, that's so cool. And you just kind of watch it and you squirm and you wonder how they did it. And yeah, I just, and there was a mixture. I mean, it was awesome. It was catchy music. The The colors of the 70s were, were bright, uh, bright and vibrant. I, I think it was just, it was more the zombies. The zombie genre is my favorite genre. I, I'm I'm pretty particular when, I, when it comes to zombie films. I watch them a little bit differently. But it, it wasn't until I got older and really into high school and late high school and college when, when the internet started to become a thing that I started to understand there was more of a meaning to that film and, and, and seeing interviews with George that I, it started to, to hit me at a different level and it just really ingrained me more 
uh, into loving the film. That's awesome. And now you're part of the George Romero Foundation. Uh, can you tell us some more about that? Sure. Um, I had gotten to know George over the last 20 years, uh, just seeing him at conventions and getting to be friends with a lot of the folks he worked with. Um, I was actually in two of his films. I was in, I was a zombie extra in Land of the Dead and Survival of the Dead. Oh, wow. And um, just kept in close contact with George. And, and after George's passing, a friend of mine and myself had gotten together and said, we should do, we should do a podcast and, and talk about some of the stories that Fans don't normally hear, because when you think of George Romero, you're going to go to Tom Savini, Greg Nicotero, Ken Ferre, um, a lot of those a lot of those big names. But we got to know a lot of the folks that had worked with George on multiple films that you probably wouldn't know. Um, you know, Donald Rubenstein, Tony Buba, uh, Jeff Monahan, a lot of these folks that, that were there and, and saw George from a different perspective. So we started a podcast called WGON Radio. And we took the the call letters from from Dawn of the Dead and started doing, you know, these these interviews with folks and going over topics and news. And and then we started deconstructing Dawn of the Dead minute by minute. So we'd watch a minute of it and talk about it. And and I had gotten a call from from George's widow, Suze, and she said, hey, we're, we're looking to do some different things with the foundation. Would you want to help us out once or twice? And we said, sure. So over the summer, right after the movie Host came out, we we had the cast and crew of Host on a, a on a dual branded show, and that really that was fun. That's uh, amazing. I love that that movie. Oh that was God, so that, great. Oh my God, I was I was so excited for it. I kept hearing about it, and I, I think it was probably by the time I got home from work, everyone was just flooding social media like you got to watch Host. I know, and it hasn't stopped either. No, I, I I'm like. I, I follow all these guys on social media and they are just the absolute coolest bunch of people that have come out of this COVID thing. And I think I, I probably watched Toast once a day for a week just because I was just really into it. I was trying to find all the Easter eggs because they had talked about, they had hit, you know, uh, Jed and Rob had talked about hiding stuff. And I wanted to watch each each of the characters individually. Like I wanted to focus in on, you know, Gemma or Emma and and do it like that. And so we did that show and it, it's got them thinking, it's like, well, what if we had a consistent show? What if we did something like this? Because this environment, this, this Zoom environment that we're in, they weren't able to do film festivals. You know, we can't go to conventions. So we decided to partner with them and become the George A. Romero Foundation Network, the GARF Network. And so far, we've, we've hosted a 25th anniversary retrospective of Tales of the Hood with Rusty Cundiff and cast. We did a show with Ed Polgardi from The Wretched. And we just did a 30th anniversary Tales from the Dark Side. So we're, we're really getting a chance to sit with people during some of these big anniversaries, but also giving folks a chance that say, I'd love to come out. I just, my schedule doesn't permit three, four days worth of travel. So we're reaching out and just saying, okay, let's, let's sit and talk. This is a great time. You have a captive audience. So we, we've been doing the, the Garf Network for a while, and we have a show upcoming here with Tina Romero, George's daughter, and we're doing a Daughters of the Dead event where we're talking to some of the daughters of Tom Savini, Scott Reininger, uh, Lori Cardiel, and, and Tina. So that's going to be a fun one that we have coming up this week. And we've already got stuff in the pipeline for probably the first half of 2021. So we kind of got shot out of a cannon uh, during this thing, but I'm, I'm excited. It's, it's, I didn't expect to be doing this at the end of 2020 when we were, <laughs> my co-host and I, we sat down and said, let's change up the format a bit. So we went from an audio only podcast to doing something like this. And, and that's just kind of how it progressed. And, I would never have thought we'd be doing something like that six months ago. And it's just super exciting. Yeah. Oh my God. That sounds awesome. So <laughs> the daughters of the dead is going to come out this week or you're you, um, recording it this week. Yeah. October 29th. So Tina had sat down with, with the, with the ladies and done some podcasts and then we're going to do like a little round table catch up uh, and it's going to be live uh, on Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, and just kind of do a round table and just kind of catch up. Cause Eric and I haven't gotten a chance to talk to the, the other ladies yet. So we're just excited to that because I mean, these are daughters of folks that I've known and watched for 20 plus years. So it's going to be interesting to see their perspective from being a child of someone who is a household name, uh, not just in the horror genre, but I mean, pretty much pop culture, you know, you, you say Tom Savini, you, you can instantly 
probably in a crowd of 10 people have five or six people that are going to know who he is uh, when you associate that stuff. So that's, yeah, we're excited for that one. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, where can people find the podcast? Uh, you can go to the George A. Romero Foundation Facebook page. We stream live through there, but uh, again, we go, we have the Garf Network on YouTube, the Garf Twitter account. Uh, we have a Twitch Uh, And then we also upload the podcast as audio only format. So people that can't tune in live can still enjoy the content. So we have Spotify, iTunes, uh, all the major spots for, for all of that stuff. Uh, So getting to your book, you wrote the definitive book on 1999's The Blair Witch Project called Eight Days in the Woods. I recently rewatched The Blair Witch Project for the first time since 1999 when I saw it in theaters. And it looks like a brutal eight days in the woods. I was like, I would never do that. I have some questions after rewatching it as to why they didn't just follow the stream and keep going until it ended because it would have come out somewhere. But that's neither here nor there. So I have to ask, why do you love this movie so much? And besides writing this book, what is your history with this movie? I started out as a fan. 1999 was the year I had graduated high school. So that summer between high school and college was that kind of like waiting, excited to go to college and you're working, you're just kind of doing my own thing and, you know, working, hanging out with friends. And and that was the first full summer that I had the internet at home. I, would, I mean, we were still on dial-up. So you could go online after you watch something and you start chatting And this. These were the AOL days. So you're on instant messenger talking to friends and, and trying to figure out the internet. And I remember seeing a trailer for the Blair Witch Project. And I was like, Oh, this is interesting. Cause at that point you're used to seeing like a preview of the monster or, or something to shock you. And I'm like, this showed nothing. And I, you know, it wasn't even Google at that point, probably Yahoo and just typing in the Blair Witch Project. And there were already fan websites. I had been running my own Dawn of the Dead website at the time and stumbling upon some of these. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And I'm like, okay. And then you find the original website that the the company had put up and you're like, okay, well, there's nothing here either. Just video, some very short video clips. And it kind of gets you interested. I'm like, oh, there's a whole mythology. Like, I still don't know what this movie's about. You know, I know it's about kids that went into the woods. Okay, well, what's happened? Like, what? And you don't don't know anything up until then. You go, okay, well, they found their car. They have this, you know, this evidence, and and then you find out, like, oh, there's this whole myth of the Blair Witch from from the town of Blair. I never believed it was real, but I was enthralled by the fact that I didn't really know what this movie is about. I remember people asking me, like, what it's about. I'm like. I don't really know. It's kids going to the woods. Stuff happens, I'm assuming. And it was that whole summer just sitting in front of the computer at night and trying to find places and message boards and people were talking about it. And I was downloading wallpapers of the stick man to put on my computer at the time. And it was, it was a fun summer. And then f- it was like the culmination of it at the end of July. I was like, thank God I can finally see this movie. And luckily I'm, I'm one of those folks that I'll pre-buy tickets the day they become available uh, it had been out limited about two weeks before I was able to see it. And of course it wasn't spoiled for me at that point, which was awesome. But I remember buying tickets and they were already showing that there were sold out screenings. So I was like, okay, thank God I can come back and watch this tonight. Cause I, I couldn't wait any longer. And I went to the, the latest screening I could go to and it was a packed house. And it was one of those, like when the movie was over, it was silent in the theater. Like the movie, the, the sound, the music was playing, you know, over the credits but there was a good like 10 or 15 seconds where everyone was just kind of silent. And you're like, Ooh, this is different. I'm not used to this. And then, you know, as we're getting on the walk there, there's people talking about it. Normally I, I don't remember hearing that before and very rarely do I hear it since, except with those large temple movies, like a star Wars or a Marvel movie, something that gets people talking. Everyone was talking about it and I could hear people were scared. I could hear sniffles. Like they were just, they were so terrified. And I was like, Oh my God, this is awesome. But it also terrified me a bit because I was no, used to being in the woods. I was an Eagle Scout. So I've done camping and hiking so I could relate to them. You know, almost everybody's gone camping at some point or gone for a hike in the woods. And, but for them to, to get lost to the way they did was it, it just kind of stuck with me. And I just drove home that night and I was like, I kept looking in my mirror. And I'm like, I don't want to see Heather behind me. Like I was just picturing her face was going to show up in my rear view mirror. And I, I, I went home that night and I was like, I'm going to sleep with the TV on. It, it, it just, just, just got under my skin enough that I was like, I'm not going to go to bed in, in the complete dark just yet. So it definitely left an impression on you. Oh my God. Yeah. Did you go back and see it again in theaters? I saw it two days later. 
I saw it again probably early September. Uh, I it was still in theaters and I was in college and I said ah I'm gonna go to like a Monday night screening I was like I'm just like I'm just gonna go and I was so excited I got to the theater and there was no one else in there and as soon as the film started like two more people showed up and I was like, oh man this would have been great to sit and and watch this in a the theater by yourself but I, I went to college like three weeks after the movie came out and two days later I walked into the tattoo parlor and got the stick man tattooed on my shoulder oh wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> you are intense <laughs> well I was just it. Yeah. I was, I, I hate saying the word obsessed. It's just, I was just, I couldn't get enough of it. I wanted to learn as much as I could about it because it was so different. And it's so many people talking. I mean, it was on the t- cover of Time and Newsweek and you couldn't go anywhere that summer without people talking about it. And I'd gotten the soundtrack and it came with a little one and a half by one and a half tattoo. And I was like, oh, that'd be really neat to get on my arm. So I had the artist blow it up and just throw it on my shoulder. And I thought, okay, this is the weirdest thing that I've probably ever done. No one else is going to have one. I didn't know of another one for like five years that someone had had. Does anyone ever recognize it when they see it? The Stickman? Oh my God, yeah. That's that's up there. The, the Stickman logo is up there with the the Freddy glove and the you know the Michael Myers mask and the Jason Voorhees masks. Uh, it, it has become a, a symbol. People know that. A lot of times when you go see art collages of horror icons or whatever on screen there's usually a stick man somewhere in there because it it still resonates with people and it just it's just become iconic because it was pretty much the marketing logo i mean jason jason didn't have a mask for until the third movie and it was like after that that it kind of became that but blair just had that stick man right up front from the start um so how how much camping did you do after seeing the movie (laughs) uh not much i was already out of scouts and in college so i don't I don't think I went camping, camping for God knows how long, probably until the year, first year I did the Blair Witch Experience. I don't think I stayed in a tent just because I, life just kind of didn't take me back into the woods. I wasn't afraid of it. I just never got back there just because I was doing, doing everything else. But that was, I was like, yeah, this will be interesting to go sleep in the woods again after watching that movie. If I probably wouldn't have gone camping the next week, but yeah, I didn't keep me from the woods, but everything else kind of did. So it was it was a while before I before I got back into a tent. Um, so going back to your book, Eight Days in the Woods, how did the idea for this book come about, and how did you start researching it? it and putting it together i was i was talking to ed sanchez he comes out every year to the blair witch experience and it was i think the second or third year it was the second year and i had asked him if lionsgate was planning anything for the film's 15th anniversary they had done a blu-ray for the 10th with some alternate endings and he looked at me and he's like nah he goes they're not doing anything and i said really he goes, yeah. He, he sounded kind of disappointed because it was coming up on 15 years and, and Blu-ray was catching on that we were getting all these big special editions. And being a movie guy, I love documentaries. I love, you know, in-depth behind the scenes. And I didn't really know much at that point uh, just because I'd gotten to start to know Ed and, and some of the folks and, and doing the Blair Witch experience. It was still very, very small. And I remember talking to him and before I could realize what I was saying, I was like, what if I wrote a book? I had never written a book before. I'm friends with a lot of authors. So I know what the process is. And he goes, okay, yeah, let me know what you need. That sounds pretty cool. And I was like, so I'm driving home and I was like, I just opted into writing a book about a movie that I I thought I knew a lot about. And then I kind of, I went home and I was like, what do I know? And then I was like, what don't I know? And the what I don't know list of what I knew I didn't know started to grow. And I was taking notes. I'm like, okay, well, then then that topic would lead into that. So I let it go for, I don't know, a couple of, couple of weeks. And, and I, had, I had said to Ed again, I said, okay, I'm going to do this book. What, what can you help me with? And he said, well, you should talk to so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so being Greg Hale, one of the producers, Mike Manello, Ben Rock. Um, he's like, start to start to talk to these guys. So I kind of started it kind of slowly. Uh, and I would say the first eight or nine months was really just fact gathering. I mean, literally sitting at home in front of Google, typing in Blair Witch Project and, and reading as many articles as I could because I was trying to find things that I would catch. So a word or a location or a name. And next year's Blair Witch Experience, they had given me a big binder of stuff. And in there were... A, was a was literally a breakdown of all the, all the footage they shot because they were keeping them on tape so they were getting a, a master list of footage directing notes a, a copies of directing notes they had given to the cast 
emails, like the, the character outlines. So the character of Mary Brown, they wrote up like two paragraphs, three paragraphs of her backstory and they gave to Patty and said, here's what you need to remember, or at least this is what you draw from. So that helped because then that started to help me start to dig deeper. And I started jumping the gun. I started interviewing people in 2015. And when I look back on those interviews, I was like, oh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to start at the beginning. And that's how it, that was the first thing I did. So I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm going to work chronologically. So I said, okay, how did these guys meet? And then I started Googling that and I found the head of their old film department. So I reached out to him and said, hey, can we do an interview? This is what I'm doing. He goes, oh, this is great. So I started there and then I started reaching out to like John Pearson, whose show split screen was the first, was showed the first footage about the Blair Witch Project. And it was just a, it was a teaser trailer, but John was one of those instrumental people whose name I had started to hear. And as John was talking, he's talking about stuff that I'm like, I can't respond to because I don't, I don't know who this person is or what this situation was. So that's when I was kind of like, okay, I'm not, I'm not as prepared as I thought I was. And then started to reach out to some, some of the folks involved. So I would talk to Mike Manello and Rob Cowie. And I said, okay, this is what I know. And I was like, I know this. And then I would jump down the timeline. I was like, okay, I knew this. And then I knew this. And, and that kind of helped. And I, I look back on those early interviews again. I wish I knew more because I, I realized how unprepared I was. Because I thought this was not as in-depth as I thought it was going to be. I thought that this was, um, it was like they came up with it. They got some actors, threw them in the woods, edited it. And then that was it. And then I started to realize how deep that rabbit hole went. And the more I talk to people, they're like, well, you should go talk to this person. I'm like, well, who's that person? Oh, well, they did such and such, or they got us in touch with such and such. So I started to build this big map, this big roadmap. And then I started to piece it together. I said, okay, this dot's connected here. This dot's connected here. And as I grew, I, I grew and grew and grew. I said, okay, now I'm starting to understand that this is so much bigger than just filming a, a 90 minute movie in the woods. Cause I understand how they made it. You know, they gave him the videotape, they gave him the camera and followed him in the woods. About a year later, uh, I got a, I got a call from the gentleman who had created the original Blair Witch site for artisan. He had kind of taken over the old Haxon one. And he said, Hey, I have tote of high eight tapes. And I was like, well, what's on them? They're like, what's well, all the, all the stuff they shot behind the scenes. I was like, what do you mean? Well, here they they pretty much filmed themselves making the movie. So they would put the camera up and just talk about scripting, not scripting, but coming up with the story. And they would film themselves walking in the woods and saying, okay, well, this will be great if they sent their camp here. Or they filmed themselves shopping or doing pre-production. That was probably over 100 some hours of videotape footage. You had a lot of work ahead of you. I had to digitize it all okay. because I couldn't, I mean, I could have watched it from the camera to the VCR or whatever. I actually went and digitized it so that I could go back and, and take notes. So I digitized all that stuff in real time and then I would watch it and I'd start taking notes. Okay, this is what their pitch meeting is like or this is what their editing meeting is like. And I would start to transcribe some of those meetings because it would just be too much to try to go back and, and constantly watch. So archiving that for them helped open the doors because then I'm like, well, wait, who's, who's this person on the phone with? So I'd write that down and then I would go to the interview and I'd say, okay, this is what I want to talk about. And I would say like a name or, or a situation. And they were like, how do you know about that? And I said, well, you guys were talking about it on the tape and they knew I had the, the behind the scenes footage cause they knew it would help. But it was, that's when that kind of floodgate that, that it opened because now they're, I'm getting them, I'm getting more in the weeds. I'm getting more into, instead of the high level interviews that you hear about and where they say, Oh yeah, we we set up trail points with their GPS and then we we did here and did this. I broke down like almost every day from from production and say, okay, the actors came in on this day, what did you do? Okay, what what was their response? So I started getting more and more in depth. And that's when I realized just how how deep that rabbit hole went. And once I had that and then I had some other documentation given to me, then I had a complete timeline. I just made a, a, a document with dates and who was doing what and who said what and who, and, and that's, that's how I pieced it all together because to me, I, I didn't have any experience in, in book writing, let alone a nonfiction book about a movie. This is stuff that I couldn't make up. 
if I had a hole, I had a hole. I couldn't just, well, I think this happened on this day. These are guys that I started to get to know in this process. So I'm like, well, I can't say that. So if I don't know about it, I got to leave it out or I have to dig deeper or find out who else to talk to. And, and that timeline started to grow and grow and grow. And I said, oh my God, this thing is massive because I'm trying to hit all those high points. One, because I want to know about it. And two, I was like, well, if I know about it, I can put it in. And then if it's not relevant, then I can remove it. I'd rather put something in and take something out and, and take it out rather than forget it and be like, I should have put this in because it makes something else make sense. And that was, that was the hardest part of, of, of getting the book started was discovering a timeline of events because for as much as they had, they didn't have just as much. So I had to find out what they didn't have so that I could fill the holes and tell the story. Wow, that is fascinating. What is one surprising fact that readers don't know about the making of The Blair Witch Project? One surprising fact. The film from start to finish took three years. Oh, from, wow. from inception of idea in 1996 until they, they handed it to the studio was, was just about three years. And they... They started with the idea in 96. They even tried to start casting in 1996. It, you know, they went into actual production pretty much 1st of October in 1997. And, and they finished filming on November 1st. So a, a, a full month of production with literally the, the eight days of filming. And then 1998 was figuring out how to put the film together because the film was originally supposed to be like your typical documentary. They would show a clip and they would go to like us sitting here like the talking heads and analyzing the footage and saying, well, that symbol represents blah, 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 blah. And then they would cut back to a relevant scene. So what they called phase one was the eight days in the woods with Heather, Mike, and Josh. Phase two was going to be filmed the next year after they tried to raise money and say, okay, here's all of our extra footage that's going to make it make sense. The Rust and Parr stuff, the reenactments. And what they found is they couldn't put them together. They didn't, it, 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 square peg, round hole. They had edited together from 22 hours down to two and a half hour version that they had screened for friends and family at the theater a lot of them had worked at in Orlando. And a producer happened to be there named Kevin Fox. And Kevin was invited by a friend, friend of the filmmakers. And as soon as it was over, he went out and introduced himself and he started talking and when they told them their idea, Kevin's like, no, you have your movie. He's like, you don't need anything else. He goes, that was good enough. And, and it was kind of, they were still kind of resisting it because they had spent all this money and time filming all of these interviews, recreating all of these documents. And they were like, but we have to use it. Kevin said, put it on a shelf, lock it away for later. We'll figure it out. They sent Dan and Ed back to edit each set their own tone. So they took a copy of the movie and edited it their way. And when they went back and watched them, each part had good stuff. Each part had something that was missing. But when they sat down together, they had this marathon meeting where they were like, look, we, we got to get rid of all the, all the talking head expert stuff. He goes, every time you cut away from the movie, it takes me out of it. He goes, we have the movie. The Kids in the Woods is the movie. And that was hard for, for Ed and Dan to kind of wrap their head around because they wanted to have everything else in there. And then they wanted it to be different. But then they realized that they were making an unconventional movie and they couldn't try to present it in a conventional way because it, it, it would have lost the effectiveness. So fans knowing that, they just thought, well, well, they just send them out to the woods for, for a week and then trim it down and then there you have it. But that was... They didn't come up with that until almost probably a year later that they were that they had already shot the film and everything else they had done extra ended up pretty much becoming Curse of the Blair Witch. A lot of those ideas and concepts became that sci-fi channel special. And then the Curse of the Blair Witch was as close to the original concept of what the Blair Witch Project should have been. So when you watch that, that's what they were going for. And while that's good, it doesn't give you the same effect as them just of them dropping us into the film and letting it run for, for 82 minutes. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting to hear and find out. Uh, the first incarnation of the movie uh, sounds a lot like how the movie Hell House LLC is mm -hmm. uh, filmed or shown. It, mm -hmm. it cuts back and forth. But yeah, when you cut back and forth between interviews and actual action, it kind of cuts the tension a little bit. It, it gives you a chance to catch your breath. Yeah. And, and a friend of mine 
Dan, we were, we were talking about the film because he was, he's their archivist for Hacks and Films. So he's got a lot of their documentation and stuff he keeps safe. And we were talking and he basically said, he goes, you're the fourth camper. The way the movie is presented, you're a character watching this movie. You're almost, you're unseen. You're there with them. So you don't get a chance to stop. Once they get into the woods, it just keeps progressing and it keeps ramping up and the pace quickens and the, the tensions are rising. And you're there with them because you don't get a chance to cut away. You don't get a chance to get that analysis. You're not thinking about it until after it's over. And I, I enjoy Hell House LLC. I, I, I think the first one is, is creepy and it creates a great atmosphere. But if you would re-edit that and take out all of that stuff, I think the film would be just as good, if not better than, than the product we got. Because when you sit there and you get to think, Oh, well this person did this. And then this person was this person such and such. And they knew it's not necessarily important. You can present that with something else, but it does it. You kind of get that. You can get that through dialogue. You can get that through interactions. You know, we can figure out who's dating whom or who's related to whom or who doesn't like whom we can get all that. If the, if the cast is good enough, if the script is good enough to give us that, you don't have to tell us, you can just show us and it can be more organic. And I think that's why Blair has a, has the, the staying power it does is it, there were no scripted lines. They were told to, all right, Heather's notes that day said, you're in charge of the compass. You're tired of Josh. Mike is annoying. And Mike would be, you want control of the compass. You and Josh can't wait to get away from Heather. And then Josh would have something else, but they didn't know what each other were acting, what the other per people were acting upon. Those notes were separate. So they would put them in scenarios by watching the previous day's footage. So they would say, Oh, well, let's see what they did today. Cause they would drop their tapes off and swap out for new ones. Mm -hmm. So they were like, Oh, Heather and Josh are kind of getting into it today. Okay. Let's, let's ramp that up. Mike, you'd be the peacekeeper today. Then Mike would get annoyed and then Josh would be the peacekeeper. So it, it would kind of flip flop, but it was, they were reacting to the scenarios that the cast was creating based on limited history and, and sound bites of who these characters actually were. Yeah, that's really interesting. Our mutual friend, Michael, he told me that there is footage of the, of Heather actually kicking the map into the, the stream is that true they did catch mike kicking the map okay. uh but they didn't know it right away so then they 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 put in one of his notes like don't tell them he did it out of frustration he didn't try to kick it in the creek he was just crumpled it up threw it down and kicked it because he was frustrated with it mm -hmm. they weren't really following the map but it was a it was a it was an item of a point of contention for the characters so he just kicked it and no one saw it they didn't realize it they just in the heat of the moment forgot about it and then on the next day, they were like, don't tell them until later. And that's when he's laughing and their reactions in character are genuine. They didn't know the map was gone. And Mike had held it all day. And, and that was, you know, he said he wanted to tell them. And he knew, he knew that when he told them that the characters of, of Heather and Josh were going to be upset. And that was, and that was what we got. And I mean, that's genuine and raw. They were like, what do you mean you don't have the map? And then you just, I mean, that's just when that film hits that fever pitch and, and nothing's really the same after that. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely felt that when I rewatched it last week. <laughs> yeah, it did not seem like a very fun experience for the cast. And I've heard, I've heard things that it was not very fun for them. They were kind of miserable. The, the there's a line that I heard Greg Hale say in, in some of the documentary and the behind the scenes footage. He goes, your safety is our concern. Your comfort is not. So they, they were really camping. They were really in the woods. And, that, and the goal was get them in the woods, follow them, make sure they don't break a leg keep them stocked with the food and supplies they need, but keep a distance. Um, they didn't move their tent. The tent was broken down by the crew and then put it that day's campsite. Uh, but they had to put it up. They had to sleep in it. You know, they were, they were, they were at the elements. They, they, they were at the mercy of the elements. So if it was cold, they were cold. If it was hot and raining, like they lost an entire day of filming because it rained so much that they were just miserable. They wanted to get to waypoint to waypoint to waypoint. They were moving so fast, the crew couldn't catch up to them. So the crew got the tent to the last campsite, and by the time they got there, it was all flooded. So they had a they had a code word that if 
we say this word, we're done. We're not filming anymore. Like someone literally broke their leg, some, you know, camera broke. So they made the call because they couldn't, they couldn't raise the crew on the radio because they were using walkie talkies in 1997. <laughs> and the, the weather, they, they were so far ahead, they were out of range. So they were, they were calling bulldozer, which was the, the code word. And they're yelling bulldozer and they got, they got nothing. So as, as it got dark, they, they kept walking. They're like, we got to get somewhere. And they came upon this house at the edge of the woods with its lights on and sent Heather up to the front door and knocked on the door and said, hi, we're making a movie. We cannot get a hold of our crew. Can we use your phone? So they went into this couple's house. We were served hot chocolate and cookies and had to call the, the team and say, hey, look, we're at this address. Please come pick us up. The flip side is they left all their gear and cameras in the woods. <laughs> so two of the two of the crew had to go out in the dark, in the rain and, and find all of the equipment because they had to, they had to salvage it. So they had to do, they had to redo that day the next day, which, which pushed them back in, in the extra day uh, or they would have shot it in seven days. But it was, it was stuff like that, that they knew they would have to deal with the elements. They knew they would have to deal with certain things, but they didn't want to put the cast in, in harm's way. So they knew they had to cross logs. Well, they weren't going to make them walk over a rickety log. They found a good one. And Ed and Dan, they walked, the, the the coordinates. So they knew exactly where they go. So they'd walk into the woods, say, okay, well, and they walk here, ping this. Now they're going to turn right 30 degrees and walk three miles. They pretty much kept them in a self-contained area, uh, which is a little bit more developed now with housing developments and, and, and commercial, but they pre- they would just walk them all around in, in zigzag lines. So every once in a while, they'd cross the same street and get back into the woods, but they they knew they were close to civilization, but it was big enough of an area for them that it, it was isolated. So it gave them that, that experience of like, they, they didn't know who was out there or where they were. They just, they knew that the crew was kind of maybe 200 yards back following them, hopefully, but they never did that to interfere with them just to, just to kind of keep them safe and to make sure they stayed on track. That's really interesting. Yeah. I knew, I knew that they were actually out in the woods, but I wasn't sure whether or not they actually had like a film crew or something with them, or if they were just mm-hmm. sent out and said, told come back in seven days but- <laughs> no they the the crew would follow them the crew had the same waypoints on their gps but so every once in a while they'd get to a waypoint there would be a, a milk crate with a, a bicycle flag on it and then there would be fresh batteries fresh tape fresh film uh and food drops so they they knew a couple of times a day they would get replenished but as filming went on they they got everything they needed except they would get less food and that's from greg hale being in survival school being an army ranger he had to go through something similar. So Greg logistically knew, well, let's tire them out. Let's give them less food. And and as we get to that point in the film, because it had to be shot chronologically. So at that point, now they're starting to get sleep deprived. They're tired from walking. They're getting sore. Now they have, you know, a banana and a power bar. And that's all they gave them for a couple of days. So, and they're carrying that, they're carrying the DAT machine. They're carrying the the CP-16. They're carrying Heather's camera plus all their other equipment. So they're just miserable. So that's just why at the end of the film, you just, that's just raw emotion. They're just done. They knew it was coming to an end, but the characters were just, they were just projecting all of their tired and hunger out to what we got to see on screen. Wow. So interesting. Okay. I'm so excited to read your book. <laughs> I particular I personally don't find the I never found the movie that scary I didn't when I was 13 and I didn't when I watched it last weekend but I do remember being obsessed with like the Earthlink website in 1999 and everything that was leading up to the movie I love that so I think that's why that's why this movie has a special place in my heart and I also really love other found footage movies now which although this did not start the found footage movie um, phenomenon. I think it started in the 1960s. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people will will reply, will harken back to Cannibal Holocaust being found footage. Which, I mean, yeah, technically it is because a lot of the film, the bulk of the film, takes place with the footage that they had shot in the Amazon, and then really nothing since. And then we get Blair Witch, and but then if you look between 1999 and 2005, 2006, 2007, there's really no found footage, quote unquote, films that we know about that really showed up. It was like, you know, Paranormal Activity, Cloverfield, Diary of the Dead, Wreck, Quarantine, that kind of stuff. Like, it took years for this found footage subgenre to really kind of 
become a thing. And and Ed and Dan and company, they didn't set out to make it and say, look, we're going to create something brand new. They just wanted to present the film differently because they were wondering, well, what scares you? You know, what scares us? So they decided to do a little different. And they, they were looking at, you know, Scream was big in 1996. And that was very meta, kind of in your face, wink, wink. They didn't want to do that. So they wanted to present it in a way that wasn't as polished or it wasn't as Hollywood it was going to be something you hadn't seen before, but they didn't, they had no idea that this was going to be kind of the, the jumpstart for a new subgenre of, of horror films. Do you have any other favorite found footage movies? I love Cloverfield and Paranormal Activity. Me too. Yeah, you know, I, I, I enjoy Cloverfield. I, I probably watched that one the most of any found footage film. I just watched it a couple of weeks ago. The VHS series, I've only seen the first two. I really, really enjoy those. I enjoy George's Diary of the Dead um, because it was interesting to see such an old school filmmaker like George kind of tackle something new. You know, and then, you know, Ed did Exists, which is a found footage Bigfoot movie. Dan just did Skyman. It's it's weird. I There's so many out there. Sometimes I don't realize I'm watching a found footage film maybe because I've seen Blair Witch hundreds of times in the last couple of years, just researching the book. I think when they're done right, I think they're very effective. And, you know, I'll go on record and saying I like most of the paranormal movies because I just think, okay, they're trying to take this concept of, okay, why would you set up a VHS recorder and how would that work? You know, they try to make it, you know, when, when it makes sense, I think the film benefits from that. But if you're making it just to make it, it doesn't work right. But yeah, VHS 2, I, I love. There's a segment in there that still creeps me out. Have you seen that? I haven't. I tried watching the first VHS and I just thought it was a little weird. I think it wasn't what I was expecting. So I need mm-hmm. to go back eventually. Yeah, I like that it's an anthology. I, I like anthologies to begin with. Uh, but there's a, there's a, I think it's the last segment of the movie. It takes place in this Tibetan cult kind of place. And it just gets like super creepy. Uh, so I really enjoy it. But stuff like, you know, Cloverfield, Paranormal Activity, they're, they've kind of reset the benchmark. I'm not ever turned off by a found footage film. I want to see what someone's doing with it because I think there's a lot that that genre hasn't tackled yet. And a host was, was so, done so very differently. Is it found footage? Yeah, technically it was all done on Zoom. Yeah. Okay, that, sign me up. I mean, that was part of the reason I was, I was so excited to watch. I'm like, wait, the whole movie takes place on Zoom? All right, I'm done. Sign me up. Yeah, um, also another movie that takes place entirely online is um, Searching. Did you see that one? I haven't. That one in, um, oh, what's the other one? Unfriended? Unfriended, yeah. Those are yeah, both I, both really good. I need, have you watched One Cut of the Dead? No. Do you have Shudder? Yes. It's on Shudder. Okay. Watch it. It's, it's, it, it's not what you think. Okay. Oh, yeah. One Cut of the Dead was, was pleasantly surprising. Well, I have to say thank you for uh, writing uh, Eight Days in the Woods, and maybe it's for the best that you didn't know what you were um, taking on before you did it, because if you had, you may not have done it. Yeah, it was... I like to learn about certain films at, at different levels. I'm, I'm a big fan of if I pick up a, a, a new Blu-ray and I'm like, this has a four hour behind the scenes documentary, I'm sold because I know they get to go into the weeds a little bit. And that's like, there was a point where I was like, am I going too into the weeds? But then I was like, a lot of people don't know that this film is in depth. What it took to get this film made is as in depth as what they thought. And especially with the pre- the post production stuff was was actually my favorite part of writing the book was figuring out how to put it all together, and then getting to the Sundance Film Festival, and then now dealing with a studio like the, it was to the back half of the book that I really started enjoying it because I one I knew what to ask, I knew where it was going and how it would end. But then I started to understand, I'm like, oh, this is a lot more than what I was expecting. And that's what I want people to, to know was that they just didn't pick up the film, the camera and send these guys under the woods and then recut it on, on the computer and boom, now we have a movie. There was, there was a lot of subplots, I guess you could call it, that I really wanted to tackle in depth and I just couldn't get to the people that had been there. There was only like two or three topics that I really didn't get a chance to get as in depth into as I wanted. And at that point, I was like, oh, am I going to feel complete? But I was able to track down people that had never been interviewed and that had really had never talked about the movie. So that was that kind of made up for it in the end. 
I was like, well, hey, I finally discovered who this person was and introduced them to the cast and crew and said, hey, look who I found. That was fun for me. And it was a balancing act of how much do I want to do this for myself versus how entertaining is it going to be for someone to read? Because I didn't want it to read like vacuum cleaner assembly instructions. You know, day one, they did this and this person said this. I was, I was trying to find that story. I was trying to hear the emotion from people reminiscing about this film because we're still talking about it now, 21 years later. So it meant something. Definitely. And maybe we should have started with this, but you lead um, a tour of all the filming locations called the Blair Witch Experience. When did you start doing it and what goes into doing it? Uh, I started that in 2013. Um, In 2000, I had gone to visit the house from the end of the film. I had found the location and I cut class that day in college and, and drove out. I didn't go to Burkittsville in 2000 until 2012. I just, it just, ne- I just never got back down there. I only lived two hours from it. So there was no reason why I shouldn't have gone back down. But a friend of mine um, introduced me to a gentleman named Adam the Wu. He's a YouTuber who does a lot of location videos. And he goes, Hey, you'll like Adam. He just did all the Blair Witch stuff. And I was like, Oh really? So I watched and I said, I got to go do this. So I went down and I started talking about it online. And a friend of mine was like, hey, we should go down and camp. We should go see all the stuff and then we should camp in the woods. Let's invite Eduardo and all this stuff. And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, well, and my friend couldn't come, but we had already invited Ed. And Ed's like, hey, I'm talking about this tour you're doing on a podcast. When are you doing it? And I said, well, it's going to be on this day at this time. And it was, I mean, it's free. I just put it on Facebook and said, hey, whoever wants to show up. Three people showed up for the first tour, which involved me saying, okay, hi, nice to meet you. First of all, we're going to spend the day together in the woods and then we're going to go camping afterwards. Like, okay, that's not creepy at all. Um, I said, I said, well, here's where we're going. I gave, I made up like a little pamphlet. I said, okay, here's the address. I'll meet you there. And then I kind of did. Okay. So here we're at Burkittsville Cemetery. Why did they choose Burkittsville? They were driving around looking for a small little town. Why did they choose this? We don't know. They just, they left it up to the filmmakers. And then this was the town's experience. And I did that at each stop. I hadn't at that point figured out where they had hung the stick men. Cause that was a big location. Cause that's in the middle of the woods. Like how the hell am I going to find that? And where they set up their camp and they open up the tent and there's the rock piles, the rock cemetery. Ed had said, no, no, I'm going to come out and hang out. I'm thinking, Holy crap. The director of the Blair Witch Project is going to come on my little event and hang out with us i'm like this is super cool and he gets there and he says well do you know where do you know where the the rock piles were i said no he goes oh come on so there's seven or eight of us walking in the woods and ed's like it's up that hill (laughs) like okay (laughs) so we just walk up the hill and he goes this is where the campsite was and he goes if you want to go see where we hung the stick men let's go of course so it's like a five minute drive from where coffin rock and all this stuff is and he takes us back in the woods and he goes this is where all the trees were and you could see like all the pine trees are lined up in certain ways because this is where they were because they crossed the stream coming this way and I was like oh my god this was great because I never thought I'd be where they hung all the stick men so that was when I got home that weekend I said oh there's no Blair Witch group on Facebook so I made a Blair Witch Facebook group and I started inviting my friends and then I invited Ed and Ed's like hey Greg come here Dan Meyer come here and like all of a sudden like the cast and crew are hanging out in this group and they start talking about the Blair Witch experience. So I realize that this is kind of catching on. It's not just going to be me and three friends every year. Um, the second year I had eight people, most people I didn't know. And then the next year there was 15 and then there was 25. And so because it's such a different type of event, it's not a convention where you go into a hotel conference room and you can stand around and talk. There's all these logistics that are involved. I got to move people in a caravan of cars from location to location. I got to park them. I got to walk them in the woods. The hardest part of that is the logistics is okay. Getting everybody here. And you know, it's gotten to the point where I've like, I got to call a park service. I'm like, can I park on this road for 20 minutes on this day? I know it says no parking. Luckily I ended up with a friend in the park service. Who's a big Blair witch fan who says, yep, we'll, we'll work it out. But I try to make it interesting every year because I want people to, to want to come. I want people to want to come back and share the word just because it's, it's, to me, it's a fun event because you actually get to go and do it. You know, you, you don't get to go really have a convention for nightmare on Elm street at the house, you know, where they do it for the whole weekend. 
so I try to do interesting anecdotes um, or, you know, I've done like scavenger hunts, trivia contests, you know, just little giveaways, it's just ways to keep people engaged because I want them to have a good time. And we've, we've had local cast and crew come out. Ed Swanson, the, the tall fisherman that's, you know, fishing on the rock when Heather's interviewing surprised me one year on the Blair Witch Experience. I didn't know he was coming. I didn't really know him, but I just happened to get to the location and I look and I was like, there's someone fishing there. I was like, man. But then I look and I'm like, that's a tall skinny guy in flannel with glasses. I think I know who that is. (laughs) And here they had surprised me with him coming out. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, stuff like that happens. Like we, last year was the 20th anniversary of the film's release. So they had done a screening and a red carpet thing the Friday night before and that Saturday was, was the tour and so many people that come, I had to rent two buses to get people to go from location to location. And we're standing on the the rock where Ed Swanson is fishing and there's 70 of us on the hill. We're talking and all of a sudden I hear from behind me, he goes, tell me where you are, Josh. Here it was Mike from the film driving by um, and came and joined us for a bit. So stuff like that, there's always, you know, surprises I like to have for people. Like I found the mom and the little girl that are interviewed. They, they weren't planted actors. I had to track them down. And when I told them what I was doing, they were like, well, if you ever want us to come out for one of your events, just let us know. Like they just volunteered to show up. So the year after I had met them, I didn't tell anybody. So when we showed up to where they, they filmed their scene, there's Susie and Ingrid standing there waiting for them. And everyone was just totally surprised. So I like to do stuff like that for fans because I like to see that stuff. So I like to give back, you know, with the, with the experience. And then we, we camp out at a state park, um, just to, just the ambiance, sleeping in a tent, you know, staying out there. And then the next day we go to where the house, the Rustin Parr house once stood. Uh, it fell down in 2005. Um, but if you go out and you just kind of kick around the dirt, you can find little pieces of the house. Uh, bricks and all that stuff so they can see where where they were in relation um, to the rest of the movie so it it just adds to it it gets you out and about gets you interacting with people you never did because you're kind of with them for two days three days if you're if you're there the whole weekend so and it's it's built some great friendships amongst people that I didn't know not just with myself but with other people you know build like a big network and you know from the business side just to the friendship side support systems and that's what I love seeing and that's why I love doing it I hated not doing it this year yeah that was going to be one of my questions was could you do it this year but since you have so many people I would assume not we did we did a little virtual one um a friend of mine Mike he actually lives in Burkittsville and my friend Aaron um, so we decided to come down and, and Aaron started the day cause I had to work. Uh, but he came down and he would do little Facebook live videos from coffin rock or the fisherman's rock or where, um, some of the other spots were. So we ended the day in Burkittsville and did a little Facebook thing and saying, you know, Hey, sorry, we can't be here. I at least wanted to come out and, you know, thank you guys for being a member of the group. Thank you for everything you've done to help promote the Blair Witch project. You know, we're going to do this bigger and better in 2021. Uh, Cause people had been asking me and I said, look, if we can do it in 2021, we're going to do it in 2021. I don't have any intent of stopping until you people stop coming. So, and then we went to Mike's house um, and had an outdoor screening of the Blair Witch project for the first time ever in Burkittsville. So that was really cool for us to do and kind of, it, it, it took the sting off it a little bit, not being able to do it, but be able to watch the film outdoors in Burkittsville was fun. Yeah. I remember uh, Mike talking about that and I was really jealous that I don't live closer because that would have been <laughs> super cool. And the tour sounds amazing and I would love to do it if it wasn't for the whole camp- camping part of it. Cause I don't you don't, know. you're not required to camp. Okay. You can find a hotel <laughs> and then meet at the, the, the meeting point on Sunday. You do not have to camp. It is not a requirement. Um, <laughs> but I just figured it's something fun to do. Like we can sit around the campfire and, you know, I bring a projector uh, projector um, and a screen and we watch some behind the scenes tidbits. Oh, so, cool. so we'll watch, you know, like they took a camera out in the woods and we're filming Heather, Mike and Josh filming. So I show some of that stuff just behind the scenes stuff that you can't see anywhere else just to give people a little bit of, you know, value for the money they're not really paying to be there because it doesn't really cost anything. So I want to give you as much as I can in, in a short amount of time to make you go home and say, you know what, that was fun. 
Sounds amazing. Uh, maybe maybe I would come as long as I could find a hotel. There's night. there's plenty of hotels next to <laughs> close to the campsite. You're not you're not we're not out in the woods woods. We're actually in a state park. There's running water at the campsite and electricity, but it's right off of you know like US 40. So there's hotels and stuff right there. So you're be comfortable that night. You don't have to camp out. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. No. If I ever go camping, I'm like this is how I die. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'll have people come just because they're like, I don't want to camp. I'm like, you don't have to. They're like, well, I don't want to be in the woods. And I was like, you'll be surprised how not in the woods you are. When you when you see where the these major scenes were filmed, you can see roads from where they shot most of this stuff. You can see a lot of houses. So it's you're not really in the woods in the woods. But there's some people that they will. It's it's like seeing killer clowns from the outer space, and they they can't go to the circus because there's a clown there. And like some people just cannot get back into the woods after seeing the movie. Yeah. Well, put me on your mailing list and hopefully it'll happen. Next you got year. it. <laughs> um, I know you have a daughter. Has she, I don't know how old she is. Has she seen the Blair Witch Project or done the experience with you? Uh, both my kids have. Um, they, because I had to talk about it so much, it doesn't really scare them. I think because they know they've, they've met some of these people and stuff and, you know, they've met a lot of, people in the horror genre from the conventions and stuff. Um, they kind of rolled their eyes for the longest time. Like, what are you doing again with the Blair Witch? Like, where are you going? Who's that person? Why are you talking to them? Yeah. So it's, I, I think later in life, they'll kind of get it. Like they'll sit down and watch it and they'll kind of understand it. I didn't really talk, especially when I was writing the book. Like I didn't really try to like pull them in and say, Oh, you got to sit and watch this. It's the greatest film ever. Um, I'm kind of hoping they'll see my excitement and what I did from, from just being a fan to, to getting to do what I do. And hopefully they'll appreciate my love of the film and, and kind of see that and maybe attach it to something that they're excited about, whether it's video games, TikTok, YouTube, whatever, whatever my kids are going to be into. I, I would like to see them have that passion so they could, Oh, I get it now. This is why he sat on the phone for four hours one night and talked to someone. You get to know the people, you get to know the experience and you get to learn and share about it. And hopefully that becomes infectious for other people. You know, they, they get super into something which snowballs into their friend being able to do something. Um, But yeah, they, it's, my daughter would rather watch Nightmare on Elm Street part three for the 800th time because that's the only Freddy movie she will watch. I think because the first one I showed her was that one because I'm friends with Jen Rubin who played Taryn in the movie. So it's like the one she saw at the youngest, but she like, she just won't watch the other ones. I'm like, watch four or five, watch two, watch. She's now, I only want to watch Freddy part three. Okay. I'll watch this one again. I mean, there's worse movies that she could be wanting to watch, but I'm like, I can't get her to expand her eyes. And she loves Friday the 13th. She loves Michael Myers. You know, she, she likes all, all that stuff. And so does my son, but yeah, Blair Witch, they just haven't resonated with yet, but hopefully someday. Yeah. Fingers crossed. I bet they will. <laughs> if, they, if they stay into the horror genre, they will get to it eventually. Yeah. All right. So pivoting away from Blair Witch a little bit there, there was an article a couple months out, a, a couple months ago that was about how horror movie fans are handling lockdown better than non-horror movie fans. Why would you say that's the case? If that, if you think that's the case. I think because we've seen people in horror films be thrust into an unconventional, scary situation. I don't like to say that horror movie fans are a different breed. I think we allow ourselves to become flexible with what our environment is, what our, you know, what we're watching. You know, I I love zombie films. I'm not opposed to werewolf movies or vampire movies or, you know, virus movies. I I think we allow ourselves to be more flexible with what we like. You know, we, we like to branch out, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I remember being scared by the exorcist. I remember being scared by the omen, but then when you go back and watch it later, you kind of have that experience, you know, it's like, you know, this movie is going to be the scariest movie ever made. And you're like, pfft, I'll show you a movie that will scare you and you go and watch it. And I think horror film fans watch movies differently. I think we, we understand what the movie's trying to do. We don't get really bogged down with tropes and cliches. We kind of, we want the film to scare us. We want that film to take us somewhere where we haven't been before. And a lot of that is psychological. 
you know, when you go into a, a Kate Beckinsale movie, it's going to be some sort of romantic comedy or, you know, you, you, you have an expectation of certain films and certain genres. Horror, it could be good, could be bad, could be scary, could be unintentionally funny. We're, we're open to that possibility. And I think we're always looking for that next classic that's going to resonate with us. That keeps us going. That keeps us going back to it and say, Oh, I was pleasantly surprised by this movie. Like heart fans love discovery. Yeah. We love to discover something and we'll, I'll watch a movie on shutter or prime that doesn't look all that good, but I'm like, Oh, I get it. That wasn't too bad. And like, yeah, I, I can relate to that. Like not everyone can relate to the stuff in a romantic comedy or an action movie or a, you know, a mobster movie. Horror movies tend to take normal people and put them in un, unfamiliar situations and scenarios. And I think, you know, movies like The Thing, being locked down with someone, you don't know who's sick, you don't know who's an alien. And you just, you kind of laugh at it and be like, oh, I've seen this movie before. Now I'm living it. We just, it's just different for us. We kind of get it. And we know that real life horror is happening. And we we get accustomed to watching apocalyptic movies or movies about society breaking down. And we see that kind of happening now. And it's just familiar to us. It's like you can walk out and you can look on the news and be like, yep, I've seen that movie. Like I knew how that ends. And it's it it's movies that are like so far ahead of their time that we're we're living this movie now and we've been watching this movie for 30 years. How do you decide what to watch when you're looking for a horror movie to watch? Well, that's a good mix. I look and see if any of my friends have seen it. I'm looking for an unconventional premise sometimes. Um, Like I just watched Hellfest for the first time last week. And it was funny because I've seen it for like the last year and I keep hearing like so many friends love it, so many friends didn't like it. And then I I watch this. Okay, well, Haunted Houses, that's familiar. What's different about it? And I watched this, okay, yeah, that was really good. And then I decided to watch Haunt because it was kind of in the same vein. I was like, oh, this one's really good too. I like this one. I, I like finding movies that don't always try to come across as more than what they are. Mm-hmm. Like, I, you know, don't tell me this is the scariest time I'm going to have watching a Haunted House movie. Just give me a little bit. Give me, don't give me a lot to go on because I want to discover the movie. I I don't know if I'm old school or if I'm a dying breed. I like to find something about every movie I watch that I enjoy. I don't really like to come out. That was so stupid. Why did I watch it? Because then I'll start getting into that habit of being so cynical. It's like, I still want to be scared. I still want to be surprised by something. Yeah. The less you tell me about a movie, the more I'll probably enjoy it because I have to pay attention. I don't have a preconceived notion. I don't want to know that there's a twist. Or, you know, or or a surprise at the end. Like, I I don't want that to be part of the marketing because then I'm like, why are you telling me the movie's not strong enough on its own? You have to tell me there's a twist in the, in the advertising. Why do that? Let me discover that. So it's, it's places like Shutter and Amazon Prime. I'll pull up a movie. I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, just similar. It doesn't have to be a big movie. I like movies that are self-contained. Pontypool is one i absolutely love pontypool and you s- oh my god it's it creeps me out it still creeps me out like i i sat upstairs and watched it the other night and i was like thank god i got the lights on because the sound because it's all coming through the radio or it's all happening off screen it just gets you into that atmosphere so like almost like claustrophobic horror yeah. like if you if you're self-contained in one scene or you only have like two people in the movie I like that kind of stuff. I like finding those movies that are done just one degree off of what I'm expecting. They just change like one thing or, you know, have a limited cast or do just do something that I probably am not expecting. And that's when I'll kind of be like, Hey, y'all need to watch this. You know, and it's like with Pontypool, someone's like, Oh, I heard about this. Is it any good? I say, I discovered this like 10 years ago just because someone had said, I think you'd like Pontypool. And I'm like, okay, I'll go watch Pontypool. And it's one of those movies where I'll, someone will ask me, what can I watch this year? And I'm like, Pontypool or this or that, because I think it's different enough that that's what we're looking for. You know, monster movies are a dime a dozen. Zombie movies, unfortunately, are a dime a dozen. Give me something a little different. You can start to see trends 
coming across in movies now. Like we have the haunted house kind of thing is kind of starting to pick up hell house haunt Hellfest. We're starting to get to that and we're starting to get maybe some reintroduction to some older characters, um, older monsters and stuff done in a new way. Like the invisible man was done completely differently than probably would have been done 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that's the kind of stuff that we're looking for because we've seen it all. Well, horror movies, horror movie fans will watch anything. We're not, we're, we're not super picky. We're just looking for something, something entertaining. Yeah, I feel like uh, sometimes I'm that person that will go to my horror movie friends and be like, have you seen this before? And they'll be like, yeah, I saw that 10 years ago because my friend does an annual scare So he's been picking out a lot of obscure things from that list. So I finally saw a triangle this month. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. And like everyone else I've spoken to is like, yeah, we watched that a while ago. But welcome. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the same boat sometimes. Sometimes I'll be like, I'm finally watching this movie. And I, a buddy of mine watched Mo, Motel Hell. I don't think I've ever seen the whole thing, but I know a lot of my friends love it. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta give this thing a watch sometime. But it's just like one of those, like it's never like a Motel Hell kind of night for me. Like I haven't gotten to that point yet. Even though I know I want to, I don't, it's not to the point where I want to go out and buy the Blu-ray, but I want to, I want to sit and watch and I want to see if it's as good as people say, because I think sometimes we, we ramp up the expectations of certain films because the first time we saw it, we had discovered it and it was so awesome. And then sometimes I am a little let down. I don't want to say let down. It just didn't get to where I wanted it to be. Yeah. Um, but I still, again, I try to find something I enjoy about every film I discover or film someone makes me watch yeah you're better than i am (laughs) (laughs) so have you had any noteworthy experiences while seeing a horror movie in theaters i mean blair was the first one i can remember i remember seeing paranormal activity and hearing people gasp Mm -hmm. movies that really make you pay attention to the screen are are the ones like a quiet place was probably the last one i could remember because there was such a void of of sound you had to pay attention and then it comes up and it gets you and you can hear the people jump and you can hear, <gasps> you hear that, that audible gasp, even like Halloween that came out like two years ago. Like there's people applauding, like we're applauding the bad guy. We're applauding Laurie Strode, but we're also applauding Michael because we know he's going to kick some ass and we know we're going to get something interesting. There's a, there's a, a wide range of experiences, but I, I'm enjoying the ones where people are get, they get generally creeped out because now I'm listening for the audience reaction, which catches me off guard because I'm trying to pay attention to them and not so much what's on the screen. So then I get shocked and I'm like, Oh, that was fun. <laughs> um, but, and that's what I do when I tell people about movies. I'm like, just watch it. Like, is it scary? I'm like, just watch it. Like I enjoyed it. I'm not telling you why I enjoyed it or what made it enjoyable. I want you to watch this movie, watch it at night, turn off the lights Yes, you're going to be scared, but you know what? Just just watch. You'll, you'll find something you like, and that's that's what I like to do to, for people for the in-home experience then as well. That's good advice. Yeah, I definitely remember seeing A Quiet Place in theaters. Yeah, I mean, just, just stuff like that, like movies that draw you in, like, you know, like It Follows kind of draw, drew me in because once I started to realize I had to look in the background or I had to kind of, I had to be on my toes, Um Stuff like that, like, I'm like, oh, this is fun. Because then I'm wondering, are, are other people watching this the same way I am? And then when you do find it, you hear someone like two rows back, like, look, look in the back, of the, look, look in the background. <laughs> so it's, it's fun when you find people that are engaged with the movie and it's not just a general audience going for like, oh, I'll go see a stupid, scary movie. When you know people are there that are enjoying it, it you feel that energy and you're all just kind of like, you're bonding over this movie that you're never going to talk about with them, but it's just like you have that shared experience. And then the people that go and they're like totally frightened because they don't ever watch horror films. You just, you have fun with, cause you're like, Oh yeah, I, I know a few people like that. <laughs> I wish more people would go see horror, but. Uh, that reminds me last Friday, I went to one of my neighbor's apartments uh, to watch scream. Cause she's not really a horror movie fan. She's in probably her late fifties. Um, but she was like, everyone always talks about scream and I know you like horror movies. So will you come over and watch it with me? And I was like, yeah, of course it's great. And then her son was also home from school and he was born in 1996. So he's also just never gotten around to seeing it. So it was fun watching it and listening to them try to predict who the killer was and reacting to all the kills. And my neighbor is a doctor. So um, at the first, sorry, spoiler alert, when uh, Steve dies in the beginning and his 
insides or on the outside, uh, she leaned forward and she's like, wait, what's that? What, what, what organs are those? <laughs> if they're listening to this, this show and they haven't seen Scream yet, I, I mean, there, there's, a, I, I know there's a good amount of people that, that didn't like Scream. I don't, I didn't see the first one in the theaters. I saw the second and third in the theaters and I liked what they were doing with it. I, I, I feel that that was the definite click in the nineties that got horror films kind of more traction because they were moving from the serialized slasher sequels and they were starting something new. And that was, that was a kickoff point. So I scream definitely holds its its place in, in the history of, of horror films. And I have a lot of friends that, I mean, they celebrate that film. Like I celebrate Blair Witch and you know what? I'm glad because it, I think it's deserving, but I, I think I've shown my kids scream. They might like scream two more. I don't know. Sometimes my kids don't have the best taste, but I, I try to show them scream, scream two, and, and I try to get them to see the references. So in, in scream, when um, Henry Winkler comes out of his office and he sees Fred mopping the floor. Yeah. My daughter's picked up that that was supposed yeah. to be Freddy Krueger. And I was like, but do you know who that person was? And she said, who? I said, well, that's Wes Craven, the guy who made this movie. And, and she goes, oh. Yeah. <laughs> my, son, my son tries to be slick and watch the YouTube videos about the movies before we go see them. To him, watching a movie is watching the, the, the kill count video on YouTube. And then he tells me he watched the movie. I said, no, you didn't. So now I'm, I'm combating this YouTube generation where they'll, wa- they'll watch the movie and then sit and watch the movie and try to tell you like, oh yeah, wait till you see this kill coming up with the scissors. And I'm like, why are you even watching this? <laughs> if you've already watched the recap, well, what are we doing? So we're, we're combating some of the this, this spoilery culture we've created where we want to know everything before we go in. I'm trying to keep my kids away from that. I'm trying to say, watch the movie, don't know anything about it, then go watch all the videos watch all the recaps or the analysis. Like, that's the fun part to see if you got it right. I don't know. Are you going back to the movies yet in movie theaters? I haven't only because I haven't had the time. Yeah. I've, I've, I've wanted to see tenant. Um, I'm doing a lot of drive-ins. Oh, okay, I, cool. I, I live about an hour and a half from the Mahoning drive-in. I don't know if you've heard of it. No, I haven't. It's, it's been around for 72 years. Wow. They do nothing but 35 millimeter. So, the great part of it is, is you can camp at the drive-in <laughs> and it's run by some of the coolest f- folks around. Um, so this, they always do like certain, they'll do like uh, camp blood where it's three nights of triple features, you know, summer camp type movies. They'll do like a Freddy fast where they'll show like one Freddy movie a night with other like nightmare type movies. Um, so I finally got to go out this year, finally, because all the cool stuff was happening on the weekends and I had something else that I couldn't do. Well, now that I can't go anywhere, I was like, I'm going to finally go to the Mahoning. So I finally got to go up this year and they, they actually got Bruce Campbell to come out this summer. Oh, wow. And he was doing a your, keep your distance tour. So we did two <laughs> nights of Bruce Campbell movies, two triple features, socially distanced photos. Um, but again, it's, it's become a big like focal point for a lot of my friends here in the, the PA, Maryland, New Jersey area. Um, I'm actually going there this weekend. They're doing uh, Monster Mania normally has its conventions in Cherry Hill, but they had to cancel. So they're doing like an outdoor vendor type thing. They got Tom Savini to come out, Sandy Johnson from Halloween. Um, so they're showing Creep Show and From Dust Till Dawn on 35 millimeter and then Halloween and Halloween 3 on 35. Oh, cool. Wait, why not Halloween 2? Probably because Halloween and Halloween 3 are more associated with Halloween. Because like Halloween 2, it picks up, but there's not, I don't know. I'm okay with it. I'm very okay with seeing Halloween three on the big screen and Hollow because I've never seen them. I've never seen any of these on 35 and I've tried to teach that with to my kids. I'm like, it's on 35. They're like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> I was like, so I have to hold up like a film negative. And I'm like, this is film. This is what a movie was on. <laughs> and, and I try to tell them, I was like, they don't make movies like that anymore. So this is, you know, when I went to the movies as a kid, everything was on 35, but it wasn't a big deal. And now it is. So we get to go and camp out, see all our friends, like one last hurrah before the end of the year and, and watch some great movies outdoors on, on the big screen. So unfortunately that's the only time I've had to actually get back to the movie theater just because work and everything else that I've had going on has been keeping me from getting to the films because they're not showing them as much, you know, they might have like two screenings and it's on a night. The only night I could go is the only night I have off from doing something else. 
So it's it's been weird. Like I I haven't been in an actual movie theater since I took my daughter to see Friday the Thirteenth Part Five on thirty five millimeter at the Colonial, which was like the week before everything shut down. And it's mm-hmm. it's unfortunate. I want to go back. I miss it. What about you? I have not been. I don't know if movie theaters are open again in New York City, but um, I know they are in New Jersey, which isn't far. But I'm also not. I'm not traveling to. Yeah, I have I have one here in town. I don't live in a very large town anyway, so the one theater is probably not packed. I mean, I could go tonight if I wanted to, but I'm like, I got other stuff I got to do. And there's really like, like I said, Tenant was like the only one that I really wanted to see that's come out. So we'll see if anything else is. I'm I haven't done really much of the VOD stuff yet. Yeah, I'm old school. I want to go back to the theater, but sometimes I'm like, just let me watch this movie. Don't make me wait a year to see it like please just get just give me this movie that leads me into my next question which is what movie are you most upset that has been postponed because of covid halloween yeah halloween kills i mean i'm i, I mean that's just to go to the theater see a new halloween movie is always fun i mean I, I i was disappointed i'm a i'm a comic book guy so wonder woman uh being postponed um the batman you know all these movies that should be out next year and i gotta wait till 2022 to get so you know the batman the matrix 4 it's weird i kind of lost sight of what's coming out because i'm like why do i even care at this point because i'm not going to see them you know i'll i'll ask me this a year from now and i'll start listing all the movies i want to see because at this point i don't even know what's coming out and when because it, is that going to happen or not i can't get excited about something that may not happen i mean i've already been disappointed enough this year with having to have everything canceled two weeks before or, or a month before movies. It's, it's weird. It's like, I actually had to think about that question for a minute. I was like, Oh my God, what's coming out? I don't even remember. So uh, it's, it's the weird. ones that I have are conjuring three candy man, a quiet place Two, Halloween kills. Quiet place Two. That was because that was supposed to come out right as everything like, was shutting yes. down. It was the so, first yes. movie to postpone. Even yes. The movie theaters hadn't shut down yet. Uh, John Krasinski put out a message. He was like, yep. people need to see this together. So we're going to hold off. Yeah, that's right. And we were talking about a quiet place earlier. So that was, yeah, that's the only, that's the only good thing is I've, I've gotten a chance to finally get to some movie location visits that I haven't gotten to. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause that's kind of another side hobby. And I have a couple friends that want to take me up to New York where a quiet place was filmed. I was like, oh, I gotta get up there before they announce when that movie's coming out so that I, I'm not like part of that town being inundated with people. I want to be the only one they're doing at that, at, at that time. So um, that's the only positive thing about some of this is getting to see some of the, the locations uh, of movies because now I have time now I can <laughs> drive and visit stuff and not worry about missing some other event. Yeah. What town in New York did it take place in? There's one, it's like three hours for me. It's like Northern New Jersey. It's that weird part where like PA and New Jersey and New York, there's a part here. And then you go up like Northwest more into the state to get to the rest of them. Um, I can't think of the names. Um, I'm just Googled it. Uh, Pauling, Beacon, and New Paltz. I went to Beacon yes. last year and I had, I had no idea that it, they filmed any of it there. And I drove yeah. to New Paltz last month. So. Yeah, yeah. I think the I think the house location is the closest one, and then like the town and everything else is more uh, up into the state a little bit. It's it's like a four hour trip, more or less for me. And that and to me, that's like oh, I can do that back in a day. That gives me four hours up. That means I got four hours to do whatever, and then I have four hours. I'm gonna say that's a twelve hour a day. I said I can do that. So. My boyfriend and I are going for a night to a town called Kingston, which is about two hours away near Woodstock. So I might make, I might see if he will stop in Beacon and New Paltz. Yeah, so. we're we're going to we're going to Georgia next month to the camp from Friday the Thirteenth Part Six. Oh, Me and a cool. bunch of friends. We ran we rented the camp out. Oh, that's fun. So I, I made up a trip, a roadmap. I was like, okay, we'll go into Georgia. Here's all the Walking Dead stuff I want to see. Go to the camp. And then Sweet Home Alabama was filmed 45 minutes away. So I'm taking a day to go see Sweet Home Alabama because I'm a big Reese Witherspoon fan. And yes, I will watch a romantic comedy. Uh, so I'm like, and it was all filmed in basically one spot. And I'm, I'm mapping it out so I can hit everything. Mm-hmm. And then I was trying on the way home. I wanted to pop into South Carolina and see where they filmed Halloween. Mm. I'm like, it's two hours out of the way. I'm already driving 11 hours. And I was like, I don't know if I can do it. And I was 
just down in North Carolina this year doing I Know What You Did Last Summer, and I wasn't able to make it then either. It's like it's just far enough out of the reach that I'm going to have to do a dedicated trip for that um, maybe next year sometime. Very cool. We're nerds. (laughs) I know. (laughs) So are there any horror movies that you love that people generally don't like? The Blair Witch Project. Um, I get that a lot. Boy, what what do I like that other people don't? I'm not one of those cool kids that doesn't like popular movies because other people like them. I know that's kind of a, a lot of the going thing now. I don't, I like those. There's a lot of movies I like that people either won't watch or that it, they've never heard of. So it's, it's, I, I'm not a fan of remakes. So I, I, I give and get a lot of flack for the Dawn of the Dead remake. My friends really love to razz me about that just because I think it's garbage. And it's not garbage because it's remaking my favorite film. It's garbage because Zack Snyder is a not good filmmaker. I don't know if there's any Zack Snyder fans that listen to the show. And and I take flack for that because he did Man of Steel and Superman is my all-time favorite superhero. And they're, I'm actually excited for the Snyder Cut of Justice League. I I like Rob Zombie's first Halloween movie. His second one is, I don't know what he was doing. I, I mean, I'll go on record and say I like pretty much all of Rob Zombie's films. I don't think that they're groundbreaking cinema. And that and that's my my asterisk when I say this. Like, I like this, but I'm not saying it's the best. I like it because I like certain things about it. I don't like the Book of Shadows Blair Witch sequel. Okay. Yeah, anyone that knows me that knows I'm on the show is, is going to be waiting for that conversation to come up. Um, <laughs> Why don't you like it? From a technical standpoint, it's not a good film. It was greenlit and filmed from january to march of 2000 like the blair witch project had just come out on home video in october and they were filming the sequel in march and the studio thought they could do better so they didn't involve the original crew and the story was just it was trying to be meta and self-referential and try to recreate this universe where well the blair witch project was a movie but it was a movie based on a real myth and then, again, Jeffrey Donovan leads a crew of people to filming locations, which I get asked that a lot. They're like, was that your inspiration? I was like, no, but it was just really weird how it happened. <laughs> I said, I'm not selling Blair dirt. I don't sell anything. I, I think what it did is it effectively killed any chance of films taking place in a Blair Witch universe before they even had a chance. So, like, Ed and Dan had a couple of different ideas for stories about Rustin Parr and Ellie Kedward um, you know, kind of the closest thing to that is The Witch from 2016. It was kind of like that's about as close as you would get to what they were going to try to do for a, okay. an Ellie Kedberg film. So really what it did is it, 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 it killed the franchise from being a franchise before it got to me because Blair to me is not a franchise type film. I think when you expand on that universe, video games, books, comics, AR, you know, virtual reality type stuff, I think that's what it lends itself to. So I think something like Book of Shadows just, it just didn't succeed. It just, it, there's some good parts that I do like. I like some of the ideas, but the execution, I think just, it wasn't thought out well enough. They should have waited another year and tried it, given it a chance to, okay, let's really, let's reread this again. And I don't blame Joe Berlinger. I think he's a great director. Um, so it's not his fault. I think there's just multiple things that weren't firing on all cylinders put together and we got something less than what we should have gotten. I mean, I like the Texas Chainsaw remake. I haven't seen it. I think it's probably too graphic for me. Oh Um, yeah. I like, like I don't, yeah, but see like remakes like Freddy, like Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th. I'm like, okay, they're here. And then I have people, they absolutely love one. I'm like, I don't get it. And I, and I try, I try to tread really nicely. Like, especially if it's someone I don't know, I'm like, okay, why do you like it? What is it about? this remake that you like because if you like the remake so much why do you like it more than the original like and i like to have that that dialogue with people because i'm not quite sure because i don't want it to come off as like well you're trash because you like this movie no i mean i like bad movies too i mean they're i like movies that are so bad they're good you know i just that's just the type of person i am but when it comes to to some films i go okay what is it about that movie why do you like it and you know i get a lot of flack from people that is like I don't think The Shining is the greatest horror film ever made. I think, I think to me, The Shining is like extremely mediocre. And I love Kubrick. Um, I love Jack Nicholson. I love Stephen King. 
I just don't, it, the shiny doesn't resonate with me. And they go, what? It's like the greatest film ever made. And I go, eh, eh, okay, fine. But I mean, it's, I don't, I don't own it. If it's on, I'll watch like five minutes of it. I'm like, yeah, it's cool atmosphere. But then I'm like, okay, find something else. And yeah. that really, that really throws people off that I'm like not celebrating the shining. Yeah, that will that will make one of our listeners happy because we got a review on Apple Podcast that said I like this podcast, but I find it <clears throat> very annoying that everyone comes on and says how much they love The Shining. So at least now you've. Yeah. I, I mean, I get it. I it's I people love it, and and that's what you know. I I, I would have to say people about me. It's like, look, he loves this movie. He loves it for his reasons. I don't say that Blair Witch is the greatest film ever made. It's I, I try not to say that because that's just that's setting expectations for other people watching these movies that will pretty much cause them to not like it. Yeah. I'm like, this is my absolute favorite film ever. I I can't quantify the best. So I I really try to caution people when I say, well, you should really watch this movie. Why? I'm like, because I thought it was fun. I'm like, there's some really cool stuff in it. There's some great dialogue, but I would never say this is the scariest movie that you've ever, you've ever seen. But I try to, I try to tread lightly on that just because we're, we're, we get so excited. We want people to love movies the way we love them. And then we get really disappointed when they don't. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, now what do I do? I can't recommend anything to this friend anymore because they're not going to trust anything <laughs> I say. And I have a couple of friends that don't watch horror. And he was he decided to watch all the Halloweens. And I'm getting this text thread of this commentary on Halloween. And... It is hilarious to watch someone not that doesn't watch horror films discover horror films that we love and revere in their 30s because I'm like this is the greatest text thread I've ever read and I'll read them I'll read them to my wife and she is dying because she knows he doesn't like horror films <laughs> but he will like it's just it's hilarious so I like when people discover it that aren't normally fans because you get a little bit more okay you find out what they like and you can steer them this way or like okay don't watch a Serbian film. Stay away from that one. Stay away from Cannibal Holocaust. You know, stay away from that stuff. Human centipede. Here, I'll give you. I'll get. I'll throw you the softballs. You know, I'll throw you the the, the Hellraisers and stuff. And you, I think you can get through that. But if you could remake one horror movie. Which would it be? Oh my God! If I could remake one horror movie. Oh, you stumped me on this one. I don't. I don't know if I would. I don't. I, I'm trying to think of a movie that I've that I've seen that I would want remade. Because I'm not, like I said, I'm not a fan of remakes. Like, Is there one movie that you saw that you thought almost was good but could be remade to be really good? Off the top of my head, there, there's a movie I, I, I came upon a couple years ago called Honeymoon. Familiar. Yeah, it's, um, oh, I can't think of her name. She plays Egret off of Game of Thrones. I never watched Game of Thrones, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um. <laughs> And, and I discovered it and it's okay. It's one of those creepy, like couple goes to the cabin on vacation and weird shit happens. I, I wish that they would have had a little bit more either time or money to expand on what we were going for. Cause I feel it, it, it almost got there. Like I, like I love the movie for the potential and the atmosphere, but it was one of those where it's like, if they would have had 10 more minutes, to kind of not, again, not give me all the exposition at the end of the movie, like this is what it was. I just felt like, give me a little bit more to kind of bite into. I felt that it would have, it would be a movie like Pontypool where I'm like touting. But see, like not remaking a movie, I would like to see more in certain universes, like a Pontypool universe. I would like to, I would like if they would remake movies from someone's perspective that is happening at that time that works with the movie. So like, a different family during a quiet place Hmm. or, you know, something where it's, it's widespread. So like a Pontypool movie where they're listening to him on the radio and they're reacting to it. So something like that. Like I would like to see more from different perspectives, not just a remake, put it literally as if the other movie was still happening and now we're watching someone else. And that's not always possible. I get that. But to me, that's just like, I wish that they would try making films differently. That's valid. That's yeah. That would be really interesting to see yeah. those movies from other people's perspectives. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen Pontypool, but I've heard a lot about it recently. So I, really I know I feel like I turned this into a Pontypool podcast. But again, it's I just watched it last week, and it's like it, it's one of those movies where I will tout. Like there's certain like I can 
think of two or three films where I just, I see it. I'm like, you need to watch this movie. It's either creepy or it's good or it's going to make you think. Yeah, you know, Ponzi Pool is just one of them. I think Stephen McCaddy's voice as a radio DJ and, and just how they do it all with sound and not seeing stuff. And it's an interesting concept. And I know it's based on a book. And I've always wanted to read the book because I know they're, they're similar, yet they're so vastly different that you can kind of get it. I think I would get everything I wanted to knowing that there's probably not another movie coming, at least reading the book. I could probably see kind of what they were going for that they couldn't make into the movie. So stuff like that's, that's kind of stuff I look at. Cool. Uh, Does your wife like horror movies? She tolerates them. She, um, yeah, when we started dating 21 years ago, she didn't really want, like she didn't want, she's not a movie person first and foremost. Um, so it, it took a while for her to kind of understand why I liked these movies. Um, so we had started dating after the Blair Witch was the thing. So, I mean, she met me. I had all these Blair Witch posters in my dorm room. And so she kind of understood what she was getting into. At least I hope she did. She doesn't seek them out. She's not like, hey, let's watch Hellraiser 2 tonight. Like she never does that. But I try to encourage her to want to watch something different. I'm like, you should really watch this one. I'm, I'm hearing this is really good. And if I'm excited about it, she probably will be as well. And sometimes she, she'll she find gems that I think she really does like. And she'll surprise me when, like she, like I said, she's not a movie person, but she'll drop a movie quote on me from time to time. Then I'm like, who are you? <laughs> because and it's from one of, like, one of my favorite movies. Like she, she introduced me to American Psycho. Oh, wow. And she, she holds that card over my head to this day. She's like, well, I'm, I saw that movie before you did. I was like, okay, well, why the hell did you watch that movie in the first place? Like, I don't understand why she went and rented it. But she introduced me to it, and it's one of my absolute favorites. But yeah, every once in a while, like, we'll, we'll find that one movie where we'll have a story that connects us to it. I was just telling her the other day, there's this movie called, from New Zealand called The Locals. It's from 2005. The only reason I know about it is because I got the DVD at a convention in a giveaway. Probably something I would never have bought. But I remember we were watching the movie. I had fallen asleep during the movie and got up and turned it off. Well, apparently she had not fallen asleep and the movie had like five minutes left. And she like held it over my head for 10 years. She goes, you know, I never saw the ending of that movie. I was like, well, let's go ahead and turn it on. I'll just make sure to turn it off 10 minutes before the end of the movie does. And and doing all the conventions and stuff, she get you know we've gotten to know a lot of people in the industry. So I'm like, hey, let's let's watch this movie with so and so in it. And she's like, oh, I like that person. Let's watch that movie. So I I've slowly been turning her more and more into someone that'll want to watch something rather than like react to it. And very rarely does she like get up in the middle and be like, okay, I'm going to bed. Like she actually sticks around and watches them now and then yells at me because I made her stay up late. But I tell her, it's like you're an adult. That's your choice. I didn't make you stay up. Sounds like you're going about it the right way. I, I mean, I'm trying. I mean, it was the first couple of years were tough because I would take her to conventions and she wasn't getting the whole convention thing. And she would want to be like, well, I want to go do this. I said, like, well, we could do that just not on this weekend. I was like, let's, and she's like, you're just standing around talking. I was like, then watch the movies I watch so you can talk. And it was, so we had that back and forth for a lot of years to where when she stopped seeing it as like, a long weekend away, just something I was doing. And she actually started hanging out more rather than wanting to just go to the hotel room or the pool or something. And she started to, to make friends there. And and people now are more excited to see my wife than they are me. I, I and They say, well, you're such a lucky man. I go, I know. I remind my wife all the time that she, that, you know, but it's just become fun. It, it, it took a while and it, it is fun not having someone that's super into movies because you can kind of surprise them with stuff. Or you can kind of like low key not let them know what they're going to watch. Or I'll totally describe a movie and not the way the movie is just to see if she's paying attention. Um, so I, I get to have fun with it um, as well. So, I mean, it's, I, I, I give up not being married to someone who's like as super into it as I am, but I have a good balance. So it's, it, it's nice. But she, she said, well, I'll come with you on this trip to, to Georgia Friday 13th. She goes, I really don't want to, but I guess I will. I was like, well, you know, Sweet Home Alabama was filmed right there. She goes, oh, I want to go. So she got excited because I do that a lot and she gets it and she can see, especially if, it, if it's something she likes, yeah. she'll be into it. So it's, it's gotten better over the last couple of decades. Very cool. Um, my last question is if you had to spend quarantine with one horror villain, who would it be? Quarantine with one horror villain. Oh boy, that's tough. I could either go with someone who doesn't talk 
so I won't have to worry about that. Ooh, you're going to have to give me a minute on this one. I'm going to have to look around here and see. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, ooh, who would I want to spend quarantine? I had to make it a villain. That's a tough one, but I like it. I could probably come up with a better answer, the, you know, give me a week. But I, I just think off the top of my head, just because I'm thinking about it, is um, the Jigsaw Killer. Jesus, why? Because I liked, I liked how he thought, whether as sadistic as it was, it's someone that if I had to sit and talk to every day, I could hold a conversation at a deep level with him and get to understand the why of what he was doing. Not that I, I don't say I agree with it or not agree with it, but I just think that character was a lot smarter than what those films allowed him to be after the first one because of what he was trying to do. Yeah, I just always thought that character was very interesting. And I think the execution of the movies didn't allow us to really explore that because we had to get to the next torture porn scene. And like I said, it's just the first one I thought because I was I was talking about Saul the other day or I was watching something on it and I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of interesting. And that made me think about it. I was like, oh, I have to go back and watch it. It's been a little while since I ran through the series. I would pick Jigsaw. Interesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> I saw the first Saw in theaters in 2004 and it gave me nightmares. So I have not gone back to any of them. But I hear that the story with Jigsaw is interesting, but apparently you're saying it's not that interesting now? Well, no, it it is. I like the movies because they're all interconnected. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I really, really, really like the callbacks to like the first film and like the seventh one. So it makes you, people that really enjoy it will get it. And and that's and that's why I like it. I I do enjoy it. I just think that the first one was so innovative, and the studio saw, oh, we could just make this a franchise. So they're going to release one a year with bigger and better torture devices. That I think what made the first one so good, it, it starts to get lost, and that's what we kind of went through in the '80s with the Michaels and the Freddies and the Jasons. Like the first ones are great, and then you get that diminishing returns. You get some awesome kills and some awesome special effects, but the story starts to lack, and it becomes kind of the same thing. I like how this Saw movie is technically taking place this time, and this one. So it's it's. I like how they thought that out. Um, I like the I. I just wish we would have had more of Jigsaw himself in in some of them because I think he was the most interesting part of that film because it's if you tell it from his perspective it'd be a very different story. What you were saying kind of reminds me where uh, the seventh movie will do a call back to the first movie reminds me of the Final Destination movies. Have you seen all of those? I have not seen them all. I'm trying to think if I've seen there's how many. Five? I think I've seen at least three. Okay. You can skip number four because it's terrible, <laughs> but watch number five. Okay. And I just started, I just watched them this year. I, I forget where they were on. I was like, ooh, <laughs> you know what? I'll watch Final Destination finally. And that's, it was just one of those days where I was like, oh, I can watch like the first two or three in one setting because I wasn't doing anything. And I was like, oh, okay. I, I finally get a chance to watch them. And yeah. uh, I did enjoy them. I, yeah. I was I was surprised. I liked them more than I thought. I thought I'd been like, okay, they're fine. But yeah. then I was, I was like, these are really good. <laughs> uh, number five, I believe, is on HBO Go right now or HBO Max, okay. whatever it's called. So watch that one. The ending just left me speechless a little bit. Okay. Not to build it up too much, but I don't know. No, no. Who would you Who would you quarantine with? What What's your answer? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm. Someone that doesn't talk. You host a podcast and you're not a talker. I know, I know. I ask these questions <laughs> to everyone and I never think of my answers. The little girl from the ring, Samara, so that we can braid each other's hair. <laughs> no, I don't know. She's terrifying, but I love the ring. Um, I yeah, so do I. So do I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, mean, that's a, I mean, that's a good one. Like, But it's, it's hard. It's like, well, the villain, you know, there's... There's so many, there's so many answers with that, but then there's like, you know, which like character from a horror movie would you like to, you know, yeah. you know, quarantine with? I was like, shit, give me McCready from the thing or, <laughs> you know, some, you know, I, I like to think of those answers that are like, maybe they're not most popular, but I, I kind of look for the long term. Like if I'm quarantine, quarantined with someone, I want to, I want to, you know, hang out with them because of. It's not going to ever get boring. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, Matt. This was so much fun. Uh, do you want to tell everyone where they can find you? Uh, yeah, you can um, You can find me on Facebook. I usually hang out in the official Blair Witch Project Facebook group. 
um, Blair Witch um, also Blair Witch Experience on Instagram. I'm usually always hanging out, sharing whatever it is I can and, and promoting Blair Witch and really celebrating some of the awesome stuff I see on, uh, on Instagram and Facebook. I love seeing the, the artwork and the tattoos and, you know, the clothing and the pins and all this stuff. I think, I think Blair has really found a, its resurgence, you know, from that first summer. I think, I think people are finally starting to get, it wasn't as bad as we were thinking. And they were like, cause you remember when you saw it, like you remember the first time you watched it. And it, you can't say that about a lot of movies. So I think that's why it's sticking around. So yeah, that's usually where I'm hanging out the most. All right, cool. Well, thank you again for being here. And, oh, thank uh, you for having me. I will see you around on Twitter. I'll be there. That's it for this week's episode of Who's There. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Matt. And thanks again to Matt for taking the time to chat with me today. You can find a link to buy his book, Eight Days in the Woods, in the show notes, as well as links to his Twitter account, The Blair Witch Experience, The Blair Witch Facebook group, and the George A. Romero Foundation. As always, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a second to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our feed wherever you listen to us. Thank you to everyone who's already left us a review. We really appreciate it. You can follow us on Twitter at Who's There Pod. We're on Instagram at Who's There Podcast. Or you can feel free to shoot us an email at the Who's There Pod at gmail.com if you have any questions, comments, concerns, horror movie recommendations, or you'd like to be a guest. Until next time, stay scary and wear a mask. <laughs>